morning, Crossroads Church. Let's stand up together. Great to see you. Hope you guys are doing well and had a great week. Who's ready to give praise to the Lord Jesus? Come on, let's lift up our voices today. Let's honor the King Jesus. Let it rise, let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. So let it today. We declare your power and your strength. We declare the name Jesus over every circumstance today.
us today, we pray. Come and breathe your miracles. Amen. Why don't you guys be seated today? So good declaring the truth of the power of who our God is and the power of his gospel. Amen. Hey, today we're going to celebrate communion together. If you're a guest with us today, welcome to Crossroads. We're so glad you're here. Um, as we take communion today, we want to invite you to take communion with us. You don't have to be a member of Crossroads Church. We just ask that you be a follower of the Lord Jesus. Here's what it looks like in just a moment. This good-looking man right here, Mike McPeak, is going to lead us. <laughs> that was good. He's going to lead us in communion. And when he's finished, he'll pray, and then we'll have servers that will come around the room with trays. And so they'll bring you in the tray. You can grab, um, the cups are stacked. There's juice on the top and the, the bread on the bottom, so you can just grab a stack. And then if you'll hold on to those, because we're going to take communion, everyone together, in just a few moments. And if for any reason you're not taking communion today, you can just send the ushers on by, and that'll be great. All right? Good morning, Mike. Good morning, y'all. I got to do this first service, and we'll see how much I can remember what I said. <laughs> can we get the First Corinthians back up there again? It said, The Lord Jesus, on the night he betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it. Remember me. We come here right now, and we said we're about to take the Lord's Supper, and it's the Lord's Supper we're taking. And we sit around his table. And I sit there thinking about a lot of this right here. I'm thinking, well, as we come before him and sit in front on his table, we've already said he was Lord in our life. That gives us the seat at the table. He asked us. We got an invitation, but he asked us, and we said yes. So we take the Lord's Supper, and I'm thinking, why is he asking us to remember? What is it he's asking us to remember? And when I got asked to do this, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I didn't tell him in the first service, but I mean, I, I went like everywhere just thinking, okay, this is what I want. No, I'm going to say this. And a lot of things that came to me, I was thinking about, let's tell him about, you know, okay, how sin come in the world. And we got separated from God. We have no way to get back. And it took this sacrifice <laughs> to bridge the gap. And I thought, no, that's, that's not what he wants. And then I sat there, and the next thing comes to my mind, I'm thinking, when you get a lot of time to think about this, and I'm thinking, then Peter had a vision. You know, and the, the sheep come down three times, and all the animals only tell him, get up and kill and eat. He said, surely not, Lord. I've never taken anything impure. He said, don't call anything unclean that I've made clean. And then he realized this gospel is for everyone, not just the Jews. But I thought, no, I'm not going there. <laughs> and then I thought, you know, okay, what do you want me to see in this, Lord? And I'm sitting there thinking about this, and then he takes me. <laughs> you know the disciples? The disciples were huddled up in a room in fear. Mary had just been to the tomb. She runs back to him and tells him, it's true, he's alive. And they didn't believe her. And then later on, the two men, from the, the two disciples from Damas, uh, going the road to Emmaus, when they recognize Jesus and realize it's alive, he's alive, it's true. They run all the way back to tell somebody else. And all about the disciples, I'm sitting there thinking, all this stuff, what they couldn't see or what they didn't know. They didn't know it was true. And they kept getting reports, it's true. It wasn't until Jesus stood on amongst them. And they knew it's true. He's alive. And I'm telling you right now, he is alive. And I'm sitting there, and God took me down the road, sir, and thinking, what would take a man that denied the Christ three times after he told him, I will lay my life down for you? He said, really? But you'll deny me. 
What would take that same man when he knew it's true and he found out Jesus is alive? That he went to preach and you couldn't shut him up. What would take a same man that was bent on killing Christians to turn him around to preach to Christians? What would take two men that sat there and they traveled all night, all day long and it's nighttime and when they found out it's true to run back and tell somebody else? That's where he took me. That is the power of the gospel. That is what changes you. I sit and think about what would make me stand up on this stage. <laughs> it's the power of the gospel. And I keep thinking about what did he want us to remember? He wants to remember what he did for us. He got on a cross. They didn't make him. He got there. They didn't take his life. He laid it down. And he stayed on that cross to pay for a penalty we couldn't pay for. He shed his blood. <laughs> so you know what? He said, you're forgiven now. You have a home. You have the right to be called a son and daughter. You have a right to know you have access to the Father now. That you can walk in there and you have the right to do that because of what he's done. You have been given freedom. <laughs> it says we have been given freedom from the power. We've been held slavery to death all our life. We've been given freedom from the wrath of God. We've been given freedom to walk in a newness. And this sacrifice. <laughs> and every time I think about it, what does he want us to remember? Remember what he's doing in your life and will continue to do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for getting on that cross and we thank you for staying on that cross. We thank you for shedding your blood that we can have a newness of life, to have eternal life with you. We thank you, Lord, that you take us by the hand and you ask us to follow you. I thank you for the power of that cross. I thank you for the power, Lord, <laughs> that you tell us you put inside of us. God, help us to walk as a newness. Help us to walk as people that's been washed clean. Help us to always be a thankful people, Lord, for what you've done for us. I thank you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Take all I have in these hands and multiply, God, all that I am and find my heart, all the altar again, send me on fire, send me on fire, take all I have in these hands and multiply, God. All that I am and find my heart All the altar again sent me on fire Sent me on fire Here I am, God Arms wide open Pouring out my life Gracefully broken My heart stands in all of your name, your mighty love stands strong to the end, you will fulfill your purpose for me, you won't forsake.
forsake me. You will be with me. Here I am, God. Arms wide open, pouring out my life, gracefully broken. Here I am, here I am, God. Arms wide open. heard me say often that I, I love days when we celebrate communion together. Uh, what I don't like is being the closing act to Mike McPeak when he gets up here and talks. Um, if you're sitting in this room and are wondering, is this gospel story real? If you're sitting in this room and you wonder, can the gospel story change lives? Spend five minutes with Mike McPeak and you'll be convinced. Uh, the authenticity uh, the genuine talk of what the gospel has done in his life uh, will change your life. So I challenge you to do that. Uh, but I just want to echo what he spoke up here of remembering. And so we celebrate right now. We remember right now uh, the work, the gift that was given to us on the cross, uh, the body of Christ broken for us. God, we thank you for the body that was broken. Uh, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. It's in his name we pray, amen. Let's share the bread together. Lord, thank you for the blood uh, shed for us, the blood that covers us, the blood that cleanses us, uh, the blood that takes our shame, that takes our guilt, and that calls us your own by the washing of it. As Mike said, thank you that we can be called your sons and daughters through the love that you have lavished on us in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Let's stand up together. We're going to do two things at once. We're going to have some folks come by, and they're going to take those cups from you. And at the same time, we're going to release our students, eighth grade and younger, to go to class. Again, if you're a guest today, you've got students, and you would like for them to go to class, you can just follow. You can see Crossroads students already heading out. You can follow them out to the lobby, meet their teacher, and then come back in. Today, we're going to continue to worship. We're going to begin a new series today called Vital Signs, and it's really just to take, um, take a look at how are we doing living the Spirit-filled life, and what does the fruit of the Spirit look like expressed in our life? And you know, today we have sang about the power of God. We've heard about the power of the gospel to bring life and to change life. We've sung our response back to Him in praise. 
And now we're going to continue with the theme of surrender. And so as we sing this song, pray this song out. This is a song of surrender to the Lord, that He would come and move in us in such a way that we offer everything that we are and everything that we have to Him. And He will come as a fire like He does to a sacrifice. This is called Refiner today. If the altar's where you meet us, take me there, take me there. If what you need is just an offering, it's right here, my life is here, and I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're a fire, a refiner. I want to be tried by fire. Purify, you take whatever you desire. Oh Lord, it's my life. I want to be tried by fire. Purify, you take whatever you desire. Lord, it's my life.
places in me, within me that are not pleasing to you, and that you would ignite the fire in our hearts, in my heart today, to live lives of worship worthy unto you, to your honor, to your worthiness. Come and take our lives, refine them, we give them to you. I want to be tried by fire. Sing it. Purify. You take whatever you desire. Lord, here's my want to be. I want to be tried. as we turn our hands up toward you in a sign of surrender. We give you all that we are. We give you every part of our heart. Come and move. Come and breathe hope and life. We pray today in the name of Jesus. Everyone said amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I get the joy of being the welcome guy today. <laughs> But I'm not going to do what Mike McPeak did, and I'm not going to tell you that there's a worship night coming up on September the 5th. I'm also not going to tell you that you can register ladies for the women's Bible study that starts, I think, this week. I'm not going to tell you those. What I want to tell you is, welcome to Crossroads. We're so glad you're here. If you'll look um, on the screen, there's a number if you're a guest. Oh, thank you, Jamie. That was great. Um, if you'll see, you, if you're a guest, you can connect uh, text to that phone number, take two. If you're a guest, you can send a text to this phone number and fill out the connect card and you can receive a nice gift on your way out. If you're joining us online, you can do the same. We're so glad you're watching. And uh, today, Pastor Darren and Dana are taking Gabe back to Abilene. He's starting his sophomore year this year. And so they're out today, and we get the joy of welcoming Jonathan Ross today. So y'all welcome Jonathan. Thank you, Barry. I got to have my walking space up here. If you got your Bible, turn to John 15. We're going to be in John 15 for uh, the majority of our time together this morning. In... Uh, June of 2006, I became a father, and to celebrate my first Father's Day in 2007, uh, I decided to go skydiving. 
And so when I approached my, my wife about this idea, her first response was, has it been that bad? That, that this, <laughs> this is how it's going to end. And it's something that I'd always wanted to do. And uh, so I booked it. I, I lived in North Houston at the time. We were, I was going to go skydiving down in South Houston. So I show up that day uh, for training. And you sign these papers and they say, you're going to go through two hours of instruction, and then you'll be ready to go. So I'm like, all right, this is going to be great. It's going to be some really hands-on, in-depth instruction. So I go into this room. This instructor comes in. He says, you guys watch this video, and then we'll be good to go. And he presses play and walks out. And the first two minutes are about how to properly put on your harness and your equipment. And the last hour and 58 of this video is, if this happens, we're not liable. If this happens, we're not liable. If this happens, we're not liable. And it goes off, and the instructor comes back in and goes, all right, you guys are ready, right? And I was like, no. Like, I know nothing about skydiving right now. I'm just hoping that I put my harness on right. And so he goes, he checks your equipment, you put it on, you jump on this plane, it all happens really quick. Uh, you're on this plane just on this bench and you move forward till it's your turn. And the whole time I'm thinking, I am not prepared at all to go out of that door that they're about to make me go out of. And so we get up to the door and me and the instructor are standing there. He goes, all right, we're going to go on, one, on three. So he goes, one, and, he, and we jump. And all I know right now is I hope that I stay attached to this parachute that I know nothing about except for this cord right here. So we do this 8,000 foot free fall and we pull the cord and everything worked out well, luckily. I felt very unprepared for it. All I knew in that moment that was I had to stay attached to the parachute. Sometimes all we know in life is we, we have to remain attached to what we've been given to keep us safe. You follow? We have to remain attached. So we're going to read John, John 15, verse 1 through 11 here. And, and it gets a little bit wordy sometimes. Sometimes we get lost in the words of Scripture. And so your job in this is going to be to say one word every time it comes up. And the word that I want you to say is remain. So when you see remain in the sentence, you say remain. So let's practice real quick. Remain. All right, we're getting warmed up here. Let's practice again. All right, so turn to your neighbor, say, remain. remain. Turn to the neighbor that you don't like as much as the first one you just turned to and say, <laughs> remain. All right, here we go. John 15, verse 1. These are the words of Jesus. He says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Come on now. In me and I will. In you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must. In the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you. Don't get tired on me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not. He is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you in me and my words in you ask whatever you wish, and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now in my love, if you obey my commands, you will in my Love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful uh, that, that you tell us that your word is living and that your word is active. And that is my prayer this morning, that as we read through the word, uh, we ask that it pours over us, and I pray that it is living and active in this room. I pray that your word is living and active in the churches in our city. I pray your word is living and active in our country and in this world that lives are being changed by the gospel story that we celebrate together this morning. Would you give us ears to hear what you have to say? Would you pour through me the gift of preaching that every word that comes from my mouth would be of you and would bring honor and glory to your name? In the name of Jesus, the church said. Amen. All right, so in 11 verses right there, 
Ten times you saw one word come up again and again. Jesus is trying to tell us, remain, 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 remain. It's, it's driven home in that. Ten times in 11 verses. Most of you know uh, I'm a firefighter. And as a firefighter in today's world, uh, over 70% of our calls are, are medical calls. The majority of the calls we go on are medical calls. And the first thing that we do when we show up is we take what's called vital signs. Uh, we, we see how the body is, is working in that moment. And so we're going to look at, at breaths per minute. We're going to look at heart rate per minute. We're going to look at blood pressure uh, we're going to look at your capillary refill. If you push your, your little fingernail, how, how fast does it turn back to the color that it's supposed to turn back to? So perfusion. Uh, we're going to look at blood sugar. And all of these things give us a real quick picture by those tests of is the body working as it should be? And if not, what do we need to treat? Where do we need to go from here? We have tests all throughout our life that tell us, are we learning what we need to learn? Are we doing what we need to do? Uh, even going back to school, there are ways that we take tests to determine, are we learning what we're supposed to be learning? And there were certain t- kinds of tests that I loved. I, I didn't mind the Scantron test so that you, when it's multiple choice. And so if you get to one that you're stuck on, you can see, okay, I haven't used B in a while. So you throw a B in there because, you know, you're going to outsmart the person that made the test. If I haven't used it in a while, it's got to come up sooner or later, right? I didn't mind the essay test when it's, I write an essay about this question because I knew that if I don't know the answer, if I just kind of throw enough fluff in there, they'll kind of see where I'm going and everything's going to be okay. Uh, The questions that I didn't like were fill in the blank, especially when they don't give you a word bank for it. And so you're, you are left out there, naked as can be, for the teacher to see, do you know the answer to this or not? And we take tests all throughout life. One of, one of the things in, in history that comes up is the way that things were created, the way that, that things came to uh, be used for how we use them today. And in, in World War II, uh, Raytheon, the company, created these things uh, called magnetrons that were used uh, in the military in World War II. Uh, they were used to generate waves for short, short-range military radars. But when World War II was over, they had all of these magnetrons that they weren't sure, how are we going to use these uh, now that there is no war going on? And so they began these, these lab researches of how can we use these magnetrons? And a man named Percy Spencer in 1946 uh, came up with the theory. He's standing in this, this lab uh, research room, and he's got a peanut bar in his pocket. And he notices that as these magnetrons are going off, this peanut bar is warming up in his pocket. And so he's like, okay, maybe we're onto something here. So the next day, he brings a, a bag of popcorn kernels, and he holds it up next to the magnetrons, and he turns them on, and the bag explodes. And so the next day, he brings an egg, and he puts the egg next to these magnetrons, and the egg explodes. And so in 1955, nine years later, commercially, we now have the microwave that came from those studies. And in 1955, the first microwave, this is not with inflation added in there, the first microwave sold for $1,295, which today would be the equivalent of about $11,000 on a microwave. And the microwave uh, really changed the way that we eat. And so now uh, it was taking foods that maybe weren't meant to be cooked that way in the hopes of speeding up the cooking process. But there are foods that aren't meant for the microwave. You don't, you don't take a steak that's meant to be on a grill and put it in the microwave and get the same result. You don't take a brisket that's meant for a smoker and put it in the microwave and get the same result. You don't take a roast that's meant for a crock pot and put it in the microwave and get the same result. Uh, one of the, the worst feelings in life is when you warm something up for minute 15 in the microwave, uh, leftovers from last night, you warm it up and you bite into it and it's still cold. Isn't that terrible? But we've tried to speed up this process. And a lot of us in our spiritual lives have, have tried to, and I, I hate even using that term, spiritual life. That's just a term that, that's in our culture, but all of our life is spiritual. But I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go along with it right now. In our spiritual lives, uh, we, we've began this, this microwave type of faith that, okay, in the morning, I'm going to set two minutes on my timer. God, you got two minutes, go. And I'm going to say what I need to say. Whatever time's left, God, you fit in there. So, all right, go. So we say what we need to say. Okay, God, how do you respond to that? And, and, and you can almost hear God going, okay, oh, time's up. 
and we walk off. And then we get to the middle of the day and it's, man, why is God not speaking today? It's because your minute 15 ran up, the, the timer rang, and you took off. But we have this microwave type of faith that we want to speed things up and then we wonder why we're still cold in the middle. So how can we get, you know, God is, a, I heard this guy say recently, God is a lot more like a crock pot than he is a microwave. That, that, that'll tweet right there. You know, a lot of times I say, uh, I'll preach, that'll tweet. God is a lot more like a crock pot than a microwave. And that's not for me, that's for somebody else. But we've, we, we've fallen into this way of microwave faith. And so then these questions come out of that. We hear these phrases in our culture of, I, I need to go on a journey of self-discovery. I need to find myself. And I'm going to give you the microwave, the shortcut version to find yourself is this. The two words, find Jesus. If you seek Jesus, you'll find yourself. Seek him, find you. That, that's the intent of the gospel writers. You have four writers who their whole intent behind their book is to tell you the identity of Jesus. John, uh, I love the book of John, and John spends his whole book giving you, with Jesus' words, this is who I am. I am blank. And we're going to read through those in just a second. I am blank. I am blank. Jesus is telling you his identity. The other three writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they spend a lot of their time telling you what Jesus did. But don't get lost in that because what they're trying to do is Jesus' activity is pointing to his identity because everything is coming back to who Jesus is. And when you find Jesus, you will find yourself. Seek him, find you. It was the intent of the gospel writers. So John goes through these seven statements, these seven I am statements of Jesus to who he is telling these people that he is. He says these, these seven things. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection in life. I am the way, the truth in life. And I am the true vine. Now, don't get lost in this, in this wording because he adds the word true in there. If he would have said, I am the vine, we, we see through the Old Testament, the Israelites, the people of God are, are often called the vine. And when a prophet comes to confront them, he says, you're bearing no fruit. We see that a couple times in the Old Testament where the indictment that is brought onto the people of God is you're the vine, but you're bearing no fruit. So what are we going to do about that? Because we see this cycle all through the Old Testament of we do things on our own. Okay, now we're attacked or now something's come against us. God, help us. We'll turn back to you. And then after years, okay, let's go back to doing it. It's just, I mean, I'm glad that doesn't happen today, right? But he says, I am the true vine. And that's why he adds that word in there. So he says, you thought you were the vine. Things have changed now. I am the true vine. And will you be connected to me? Because you on, you're only as fruitful as the extent that you're connected. If you're not connected to the vine, if you're a branch, which that's what scripture calls us in this, in this uh, analogy, if you're the branch, but you're not connected to the vine, you can't be fruitful. You're only as fruitful to the extent that you're connected to the vine. And that's what he's saying here. I am the true vine. You are the branches. And here's what that looks like. If I'm the vine, will you remain connected to me? And in verse 5, he says this. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, what, what, what our internal Bible says is, apart from me, you can do some things. Apart from me, you can do the little things. Apart from me, you can do these things. And what Jesus, what Jesus says is, I'm the true vine, and apart from the vine, you can do nothing. You want to be a good husband? Stay connected to the vine. You want to be a good wife? Stay connected to the vine. You want to be a good single? Stay connected to the vine. You want to be a good employee? Stay connected to the vine. You want to be a good friend? Stay connected to the vine. And that's why he says 10 times in 11 verses, remain, 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 because apart from me, you can do nothing. And our minds can't handle that because that's not what Dr. Phil tells us. That's not what self-help books tell us. They say, oh, no, you can do these things. And what he says is through Christ, through the vine, you can do things. But when you are separated from the vine, when you are apart from God, you can do. 
You can do. And do you believe that? You know, when I became a father, there, there were these moments uh, where my kids would be doing a, a specific job. We would be doing Legos or we'd be doing a puzzle. And I would say, do you want me to help you with that? I do this myself. We, us parents have been there, right? I do this myself. And so then you sit back and wait for the moment when they're going to need your help. And so oh, I do this myself. And I want to I drop some Jesus on him and say, son, apart from me, you can do nothing. <laughs> you can't. But you wait for the moment when it's, okay, I need you. I need you. And we step in as a father. We step in and do that. And God says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But our minds, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, our minds think that, that God is running on limited resources. And so we, we see someone else's life that we judge as worse than ours. So, okay, they're going to need that much of God. So I'm only going to ask for this much of God. And I, and I want to tell you again, God has unlimited resources to pour out into your life. And apart from him, you can do nothing. But through Christ, we can do all things. That's what Paul tells us. Through Christ, we can do all things. And so what's your job in this? This is in verse 8. Your job in this, he says this, To my Father's glory, you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So your job, why are you here? You're here to bear fruit. Why are you connected to the vine? You're connected to the vine so that you'll bear fruit. You're not here just to be here. You're not here just to say, oh, I, I want to I be part of this tree. You're here to bear fruit. And so we talked about tests earlier. We talked about these vital signs. And so what I, what I want us to do this morning is I really want you to test yourself Am I producing? Am I growing? Am I connected to the vine to where I am bearing fruit for the glory of God? And the litmus test for that is laid out in Scripture as well. If you'll turn to Galatians 5, he lays out, you want to know if you're bearing fruit? Here's what fruit bearers look like. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Say those again. Love. Let's test ourselves real quick. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you are bearing fruit, that's what you're going to look like. And I want to be really clear that in the first sentence of that scripture, there's one letter missing that we often put in there. And that's where it says fruit of the Spirit and not fruits of the Spirit. Because we don't, we don't get to pick and choose which one of those we want to bear and which ones of those we want to produce. If we are connected to the vine producing fruit, you will be growing and producing in all of those. I don't get to have myself some love and, and neglect patience. I don't get to have myself some self-control and neglect faithfulness. If you are connected to the vine, you will be producing the fruit of the Spirit. And if you're not, here's what that looks like. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and all the like. And so maybe you read that list and you're like, well, I'm good. I don't, I don't, I don't get involved in any orgies. Oh, I'm good. I don't, I, don't, I don't get involved in that. Well, how about fits of rage? I cannot believe that person is still driving in the fast lane. Right? We have these fits of rage that we get in, and then we end up at the same red light right next to that person, even though we flew around them and cut them off. Why? If we are producing fruit, use this as a test for your life right now. If you are growing and producing fruit, this will be what your life looks like. That doesn't mean it has to be 100% complete in those things yet. But if you look over the last, however long you, let's say a year, six months, whatever, are you growing in these things? Are these things evident in your life? And if not, what needs to change? Well, the first thing that needs to change is your connection to God. And we got to get back to that word that's used 10 times in those 11 verses. Remain, remain, remain. Have you left? If you're, if you're not producing the fruit of the Spirit, have you left? Are you connected to the vine or not? 
A couple months ago, the storm came, came through Decatur and I came home from work that morning. Uh, we had had about 100 mile per hour winds at our house and all these branches are down. All these branches are torn off trees. Some of the trees are, are broken in half. And you know what uh, branches that fall off trees do? They die. You can't reconnect them. They don't remain on the tree. Through grace, we have an avenue to reconnect. Through grace, we have an avenue to come back and remain. But as long as you are disconnected, you will not bear fruit and you will not have life. That's real talk. As long as you are disconnected from the vine, from Jesus Christ, you will not have fruit and you will not have life. And so, Search yourself. Are these things that are being produced in your life? You know, when, when you see fruit on a tree, when, when, let's, let's use an apple, an apple tree. When you see an apple hanging from a tree, have you ever realized that that apple does not have to try to be an apple? That tree, you can't hear that tree groaning trying to produce an apple. You know, in, in our lives, we, we go exercise and we moan and groan and we're trying to get bigger, we're trying to get fit. An apple doesn't have to do that. You don't walk by a tree and hear this apple ah! and trying to produce an apple. Because, <laughs> sorry, I made myself laugh there. <laughs> Fruit isn't a burden of the branch. Fruit is the byproduct of its connection to the vine. Fruit isn't a burden of the branch. It's, it's Jesus, the vine. We're not a burden to Jesus. We're the byproduct of our connection to him. Our reflection is not a burden to Jesus. Our production is not a burden to Jesus. It's the byproduct of our connection to him. And so as you test yourself, as you examine yourself, are you connected to the vine? And if so, are you bearing fruit? And what does your fruit look like? If we're bearing fruit, we should bear the kind of fruit that people look at and want. Not for our glory, but for God's glory. The production in our lives should be evident to point to the vine, to where people look at our lives and say, I got to have me some of that. I got to have me some love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Maybe you've been to, to a resort before uh, where they put out the, the fruit buffet and man, it's good. You got this tropical fruit. You know, but some of us have been to supermarkets or you've been to, maybe it happens in your kitchen where you look at this fruit and it's like, oh man, I don't want to bite into that. That's cold in the middle. Something's wrong with that. Because fruit is not for itself. An apple doesn't become an apple so it can eat itself. An apple becomes an apple for creation, for us, for animals to give nutrition to. And catch this right here. When fruit begins to eat itself, you know what that's called? Rotting. And so when the production in your life is for you, when you're using the fruit of your life or the production in your life for you, you're rotting. We are called to bear fruit, as verse 8 tells us, to bear fruit for God's glory for others to see and say, I got to have me some of that Holy Spirit fruit. Where's your fruit at? This is honest time. As you're taking this, this examination, this test right now, what are you producing? I'm going to invite the worship team back up. What are you producing in your life right now? So we're going we're gonna to spend 
a little bit of extra time here at the end. I know usually uh, we'll do five minutes or so. I really want us to spend a little bit of extra time here. And this is, uh, as if you grew up in church, you'd call this the invitation. This isn't an invitation. This is an urging. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to examine your hearts right now, to test your hearts right now, and to respond if necessary. You know, to throw some King James at you. I beseech you, brothers and sisters, to examine your hearts, to test your hearts right now. And are you connected to the vine? And if not, let's use this time right now. Maybe we don't even know how to reconnect to the vine. Let's, let's just ask that question. God, how do I connect? How do I reconnect to you and give time for response? The buzzer's not about to go off. The alarm's not about to go off. I'm going to invite our, our prayer team up here as well. They're going to be on the outside. So if you want someone to pray with, uh, I'd love for you to go to them. The spot right here is just going to be open. There's nothing, nothing special about this carpet right here, nothing special about the stage. It's just space. If you need some space to respond, here it is right here. If you want to stay in your seat, if you want to pray with your spouse, I, I really want to besiege you to use this time to examine, am I connected? What is the fruit being produced in my life right now? Am I producing good fruit right now? And if not, let's use this time to fix it. What do we need to do to reconnect? What do we need to do to get back to? And Jesus uses this word, remain, 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 remain. Sometimes that's all we can do in the morning. As we wake up in the morning, all we can say is, God, I'm going to remain today. I know things are hurting, but I'm going to remain today. I'm going to remain a husband today. I know grief is going on, but I'm going to cling to the rock today. And, and whatever it is going on in your life right now, maybe all you've got to do, maybe all the strength you have right now is to remain. But a year from now, that's not where we should be anymore. And if we're growing, if we're producing in the spirit, we should be a step further than remaining. And there should be production. There should be growth. And if there's not, if you look at the last year of your life and there's not, we've, we've got to look to the vine. Maybe we've, maybe we've done all the self-help, self-discovery, find myself stuff. Have you found Jesus? Is it time to reconnect to the vine? And this is the last thing that Jesus says, or not, it's not the last thing he says, the last thing I want to say, one of the first things he says in the scripture is he says, God is the pruner. He will do the pruning of your life. And there's some things in this room right now, there's some things in our lives right now that are obstacles to our growth. There are some things in our lives right now are, that are obstacles to us growing into who we are called to be, that need to be pruned, that need to be snipped. And I'm going to be honest, sometimes it hurts. I mean, if you can just get that picture, let's, let's say we're a rose bush. I'm not a gardener. I'm not a plant guy. I have some roses in my yard and I know that they have to be snipped. And so if you're that vine and you see these, these tremors coming and they snip you, it may hurt. But it's for the production that's going to come. Because for a rose bush to bloom, things have to be snipped. For it to, to set forth the beauty that it's supposed to be, that's supposed to put on display, some things need to be snipped. What needs to be snipped in your life? What needs to be let go? What needs to be pushed aside for you to grow into, for you to step into what's next? And so I really want just some honest self-examination right now. There's going to be a song going on if you just want to sit in silence. There's this space here. Our prayer people are here. So I'm going to ask that you stand. If you want to sit back down, sit back down. We're just going to pray, and then we're going to have a time of, of response. Lord, as we sang earlier, I pray that the truth of those words would come off a screen, would come off a page. And our prayer is that we're tried by fire, purified in the name of Jesus. And that process may hurt, but it's necessary. 
Lord, I pray for those in this room who only have the strength to hold on and remain right now. And I pray encouragement over their heart in the name of Jesus that you would bless them with the strength to remain. We're not gonna turn away. We're gonna decide this morning. We're gonna decide this afternoon. We're gonna decide this evening. We will remain. And I pray for those in this room who look at their lives and wonder what the fruit is. Lord, would you produce it in our lives? If we need to reconnect, if we need to be watered, we turn that to you. Cleanse our hearts, purify our hearts in the glory of your name. In the name of Jesus, the church said, I want to say one more thing. God is more interested in our growth and production. God is more interested in our reflection of him than he is in our comfortability in life. God is more interested in the journey that we're on than he is in your comfortability of the moment. So when we talk about things that need to be snipped, maybe that's what needs to be snipped is your comfortability. When we talk about things that that need to to be cut off, maybe it's stepping into the unknown. I'm not comfortable with that. It reminds me of a prayer that Jesus prayed of God, if there is any other way, not the, comfortable, not the comfortable way. There's any other way. Okay, there's not, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to remain. What's he calling you to today? If the altars where you meet us, take me there, take me there. What you need is just an offering. It's right here. My life is here. And I'll be a living sacrifice for you. You're refined, very fine. I want to be consumed by you.
If the altar's where you need us Take me there If what you need is just an offering What's right here My life is here And I'll be a living Sacrifice Take whatever you You're a fire, 
surrendered to Jesus. It's good to be surrendered to Jesus. If you will extend your hands, let's receive a blessing today from Galatians 5. As you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, he will become the source of our lives and will direct every aspect of our lives. Remain in Jesus. Remain in Jesus. Remain in Jesus. And may God bless you and all those you love now and forevermore. We pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you guys. If you want to stay in worship, we're going to stay for just a few more minutes. You guys have a great week.